everybody. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you one simple trap that is virtually unstoppable, at least below 1500. And the best part about it is that uh, unlike the most traps that uh, you're used of seeing on YouTube, where if your opponent uh, defends, chances are you just uh, end up with a pretty bad position here, even against like the best play, we still uh, have a great uh, attacking idea. So uh, the point is to actually go bishop to c7. That is the star idea of the video, simply setting up the battery uh, with a point of uh, following up with a queen move. So the bishop is supporting the queen, uh, threatening to go into the enemy camp after getting rid of the knight, then infiltrating with a queen, leading to a checkmating attack. And I swear, this idea just uh, makes uh, all the beginners uh, lose their minds. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to get in these kind of positions, how to follow them up. And then in the remaining games, we're going to be discussing about how to deal with the other lines where white is trying to avoid these kind of ideas. So please feel free to use the timestamp through the description. Pick what you need and... I'll see you inside the video. All right, everybody. Looks like we're getting a game against somebody that's a little bit higher rated. So uh, almost facing the 1100s. And we're going to be sticking with a Karokan. Let's see what our opponent has in store for us. And uh, it looks to be uh, going for the classical variation. And we're going for the Tartakover by going DE4 and then Knight F6. And this is super important, guys. You really want to remember that you should be taking on e4 first uh, because a lot of the uh, people that are trying to pick up the Karokan, they usually make the mistake of playing the move knight f6, resulting in a position where white could go e5, and then you simply have no good square for the knight. So please don't do that. Make sure to destroy white center first by going de4, and then after knight e4, just uh, play knight f6. And uh, when they take, we're going to be taking with an e pawn, just getting a nice little safe structure on the king side. And, preparing to develop the bishop to d6. Now, common inaccuracy, I see this uh, maybe like 50% uh, of my students' games. They usually make this uh, common inaccuracy of starting with a bishop in. That is fine. That is what the bishop wants to develop generally, but it's best to start with bishop to d6 and getting castled first because this bishop g4 could potentially uh, lead to some annoying moments where they check. Like, think about it. Bishop g4, they play bishop c4, you go bishop d6, and then queen e2 check could be a little bit annoying because you would normally, uh, yeah, let's say, like to play bishop e7 there, but you already moved it. And if you do it the other way, if they play bishop c4 now, you can castle and there is no more annoying queen e2 check. That is just one of the reasons why this is a better move order. So hopefully that uh, makes some sense. We get castled, and on the very next move, we are ready to go for the pin. If they play h3, that's not a problem. That's um, not like um, yeah, an issue if you don't get in bishop g4 in the Tartak work, because I see that a lot of people usually just get uh, kind of stuck when they are unable to get bishop to g4. We already had many games where I'm showing how to deal with that. Uh, generally, you can just uh, set up the battery and uh, go for the typical... Uh, Rook e8, knight f8 maneuver and try to uh, somehow get rid of this knight and go for a checkmate on h2. We've got plenty of games with that on the channel in case white goes for like an early h3. So against this, we're just going to be getting the pin and uh, always in the Tartak over when they play h3, we slide the bishop back and uh, we keep this annoying pin onto the f3 knight, which usually results in opponent just going uh, uh, berserk and just playing h3 g4 overextending and uh, weakening the king side so just gonna play rook e8 now preparing the typical uh, knight f8 and then just gonna be going for the battery uh, the only time when you want to meet h3 with bishop takes on f3 is if they're forced to take with the g pawn that is great for us if you can uh, mess around with white structure on the king side However, he can simply take with the queen in this case. So I'm just going to keep the pin and hopefully uh, I'll get to show how to play after knight f8, bishop c7, queen d6. And from my experience, a lot of players would just go g4 because they are just uh, really annoyed by uh, this bishop pin. Also, some of the white players just go bishop e2, trying to uh, yeah, sort of make that pressure not felt that much. I mean... According to the statistics, they do both. Also expect moves such as c3. 
and uh, we just have a very simple plan knight f8 bishop c7 queen d6 that's what you want to do next and i know here we're gonna get a lot of these andies watching the video that are gonna be like oh but why can can't you just do bishop c7 queen d6 anyways or uh why do we need to play this knight f8 move because i really don't get what's going on with it why would i play such a weird knight move well first of all uh the knight is making sure that you're not gonna get made it so that's a pretty good night to have, you know, it's like having, uh, you know, like buy a big house. You need to have some dogs uh, right there, you know, to like uh, make sure nobody is robbing your house. That is kind of what this knight on f8 is. So uh, besides that, it could also uh, maneuver itself to the f4 square where it's putting a lot of pressure, not only on uh, the king side, but also threatening to win the bishop pair. So that is uh, usually how the knight could maneuver. And uh, also it freeze up the d7 square because with the knight there we couldn't play queen d6 and now we just um, prepare that maneuver uh, white is going for c4 we don't really care i'm just gonna go for queen d6 anyways if uh yeah they play c5 we're happy with it because it's weakening d5 and now we are creating a threat of taking followed by queen h2 check now expecting opponent to either do c5 or to play g3 one of these two moves uh are usually uh, the most common ways to react. If he ignores it, we usually get a very good position once we infiltrate with the queen. It's not like such a straightforward win, but I think uh, we do get a good position. I'm actually super glad that uh, we get to see what to do when white goes g3, because this is so instructive for the variation. This literally happens all the time. And uh, a lot of people, I taught this to like a bunch of my students and they seem to be getting here, but when white plays g3, they kind of get stuck and then they don't really know how to continue. So first of all, what you need to understand is with g3, white has ideas to go bishop f4, exchange dark squared bishops, and usually their king is going to be pretty safe after that. And uh, when g3 happens, the easiest way to remember this is that, okay, this pawn move is actually like simply uh, really making this battery not effective anymore. It's just completely blocked by the pawn. So it's time to actually do something else with the queen and uh, after they play g3 now a pawn onto h3 has been weakened that's not defended by anything and we could start by uh, attacking that now normally they will defend with king g2 if they go g4 that's a common move but there is simply bishop takes on g4 and that's just leading to a mating attack after the sacrifice so expecting him to go king g2 king, king h2 is also a move but a bit more unnatural because it's sitting on the same diagonal as the bishop and that's usually pretty scary to allow um, maybe we could just continue in the same fashion and then maybe at some point have ideas to push this pawn to use g3 as a hook. Now, if they go king g2, I want to play bishop g6 and then bishop e4. Just improving the bishop because uh, it's like doing okay on h5, but after he uh, slides back to e2, the bishop is not really having that much pressure on the knight uh, anymore. So we could definitely think of uh, ways to maneuver and improve the bishop. So, uh, let's see. He could also play a move like bishop f1 here, by the way. Oh, he actually just goes g4, which is going to be super instructive, guys. You really want to pay attention to how we actually get to deliver this attack. Because uh, I feel like a lot of uh, the black players may go for this, but they don't really have the what it takes to actually finish uh, white off. So, this would normally... Yeah, all of my students will be generally able to find this. And after King G1, I noticed that most of the people uh, will play something like uh, G5 or Knight G6. But there is actually a better move in the position that... Uh, why don't you just uh, pause the video and try to find it uh, on your own? Since the following move is just kind of forcing resignation and it's completely crashing. And that is to go for the powerful Rook lift. Just play Rook E4 and how is he going to defend? There's no way to defend. It is absolutely broken. This is the strongest opening that you could play as black, even in beginner games, even against like higher rated opponents. How else can you guys like get such easy attacks? I literally have made no moves by myself. This is all theory, very easy to apply. Standard maneuvers. It's just like a generator of free wins. So uh, I, I simply don't get people that try to play other openings. Why wouldn't play the wouldn't you play the Karo Khan when it's actually uh such a simple, solid, and in the same time has so much uh dynamic per perspectives? Um 
against e4. I don't get it. You tell me in the comments. I don't know if you play something else. Uh, why do you do that? And uh, why is it better than the Karo Khan? I'm curious to debate or like see what other players think. So now the only move to not get mated for him would be knight e5 to sacrifice the knight. But that is simply completely lost. And uh, yeah, Brook e4 just kind of finishes the game on the spot. Um, just, uh, yeah. He plays, he actually finds 95, so not allowing me to go there. But now we restore material equality while having a deadly attack. Simple threat is something like uh, Rook h4, potential mating ideas. Also, ed4 is there, opening up the bishop. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is just simply too strong. Um, so let's see what uh, opponent is gonna do. Bishop f3, very understandable uh, move. Uh, I could do many things. I feel like rook h4 is the simplest, and if bishop g2, there is rook g4 that just wins the queen, so that's not a problem. And we also have a pretty big threat of e4 next, kind of luring him into that. So now it just will take a, a few more moves because he has found the best way to, let's say, prolong the fight with 95, but really the position is dead lost. So if you look it up with a computer, it's going to say like minus 10 after you play rookie 4. Uh, it's actually ridiculous. You have no idea how many times I taught this uh, rookie 4 line to my students. It is just like so easy. It's pretty funny because usually, okay, guys, I'm going to be super honest with you. If you're trying to coach like a stronger player, it's always uh, gonna be easier because you sort of know what to expect. And when you have to work with people that are usually around 1000 in Blitz, it's actually almost like teaching a different game because these low rated players don't really play any Fury. And they have all these like weird lines, like the hillbilly attack, all the uh, weird nonsense that they do. That's very hard to expect. But I think the Karo Khan just has, is doing like a great job and keeping it simple, keeping games into like uh, this little area that uh, we kind of control the pawn structure. We know what the main plans are and why it doesn't have that much room to deviate. Uh, so that is another reason why it's by far one of my uh, favorite openings to recommend, especially to lower rated players. And after Bishop takes, yeah, I'm just... Uh, Pretty much getting a deadly attack. Uh, not super sure how we're gonna finish him off, but uh, it shouldn't be taking long. Uh, maybe just time to bring the knight. That cannot be a bad idea either. So just play something like knight e6, knight f4. Uh, still waiting bishop g2, rook g4. There's just uh, finishing it on the spot. The key here is not to rush, because it looks like we have such an overwhelming attack that it should be made in a couple of moves. But uh, yeah, no need to rush with it. By the way, I just realized uh, that uh, there could be uh, Rook to d8 as a pretty strong move. Maybe it even was uh, on the previous uh, move. So just uh, doing that. Okay, he just plays bishop g2, but that, as I told you, fails to rook g4 pinning, and then uh, he has no way to defend. Queen f3 would just pick up the queen because of the pin. The only move for him is uh, queen g4, and I'll actually show you the line that uh, I was referring to uh, in the post-game analysis uh, when they go for like, um, let's say, um, when they would have defended better, I forgot what that was, but I'm going to show you. So here, you could do anything, just uh, up so much material. It's not really important what you play, but I'm just going to keep it simple, I guess, and take a pawn. Hit the rook and then pick up the bishop. Yeah, picking up the bishop, picking up the c4 pawn next. So, material wise, we've got a queen for a rook, which is definitely very good. I'm gonna pick up another pawn on uh, a2. I'm not afraid of like rook e8 since it doesn't have any threats. Uh, looks a bit scary, but we're quite well defended. Now just time to try and trade off uh, more pieces. So I think we start by playing queen c5, just a nice move, making sure the knight is protected, attacking f2 in the same time, and then I think we can just start by um, pushing the b-pawn. And when rook e7 happens, uh, that just allows the first mate in two. So uh, no counter to that. And uh, just to show you what I meant with uh, 
playing rook to d8 earlier. Uh, yeah, here, after bishop takes, let's say he does a better move, like, I don't know, c5, something random. I was thinking we could do rook d8, yeah, just leaving the rook uh, on pre. Because after queen d8, there is bishop h2 check. And the bishop is no longer covered by the queen, so we would have this checkmate in one. But literally, guys, I'm telling you, uh, yeah, this is, I have literally played no moves by myself until move 20 against the 1,000 rated player. So if your excuse is, no matter how much theory I learn or how many courses I study, um, they're not going to apply in my games because they just play with stuff. No, here it's actually clear proof that uh, they don't and that it works. I mean, if you get the right courses, you know what I'm saying. So, uh, yeah, besides that, okay, if he would have played um, King G2, I guess that's more of an interesting move. I would have gone Bishop G6 and then let's say he pushes, get the Bishop there and uh, try to push the F pawn with usually a very nice uh, initiative for uh, black on the king side. So, uh, yeah, with that being said, I think we can uh, move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another game and uh, facing one e4. Going to be sticking with the uh, hyper solid Karakhan. And we're actually facing a little bit of higher rated opponent, almost 1100 uh rated and let's see what we're gonna see it's actually the advance which is quite interesting because uh in my opinion i feel like uh most of the people really do struggle against the advance they're like fine against anything else like arokan exchange but when it comes to the advance they have a lot of issues because they are not aware of what is like the best move below 2000 and that is c5 if you guys are already like watching me for uh more than one video Congratulations to you to be able of resisting my annoying voice. And now we do get to uh, play this C5 and we get like one of the most common uh, replies, which is C3. So when your opponent plays C3, it's already like a pretty clear sign that he's uh, clueless. Now the only kind of uh, fighting approach for white is DC5. Yes, in top level chess, uh, they try to make knight F3 work and other like tricky sidelines like that. but Chances are if somebody plays this in lower rated games, they don't know what they're doing. So we see c3 now. We're just going to start with knight c6. It would be a bit of a mistake to take on d4 because that will give white additional ideas to play knight c3. And uh, you will understand why that is actually relevant uh, in a second. So, uh, oh, that's a weird one. Opponent plays b3. I have never really encountered, encountered this before. I assume it's not like very critical since it's not really developing any pieces. Plus, it feels also a little bit weakening. I mean, the idea could be that he's preparing bishop b2, trying to make this d4 more secure. But it's definitely kind of fishy. So, uh, all right. How can we uh, deal with this move? I mean, simplest uh, thing would be cd, bishop f5. I could do bishop f5 right away. Another option could be h5 and then just try bishop g4. I'm not super sure I want to do. Uh, also, maybe knight h6 isn't that terrible here, but still I'm kind of skeptical about allowing bishop takes. So, yeah, I think we'll start with the bishop f5 move. So, I'm not afraid of like dc5, knight e5, since usually white is supposed to play with b4, and since he already committed to b3, he would be losing like a bit of a tempo with that. Uh, again, I'm just expecting him to play bishop b2 as follow, uh, follow up to like b3. But we'll see. I mean, already this game uh, is getting me out of book in one of the lines that I know the best. So uh, that is, uh, I mean, usually a sign that what he plays is quite dubious. But still, you got to be as focused as, uh, as you want. Or you can. Yep, that's a better way to put it. So, knight to f3. Hmm, just gonna play e6, trying to complete my development. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this is a little bit odd since uh, ideally we wanted to have the bishop on uh, g4 in this position, and I think uh, spending another tempo on playing bishop g4 uh, could perhaps go unpunished, but I think it's not the right approach, so... I would just like try to develop uh, other pieces in the meantime. Now, if bishop was on g4, uh, black would have won a piece with the thematic tactic bishop takes on f3. That happens a lot in uh, low-rated games. But 
uh, since that's not the case, we have a choice between, uh, I guess, bishop e7. The only thing that I'm uh, slightly concerned about is after takes. I would love to take with the knight and get castle, but then dc5 and I don't have a clear way to recapture the pawn. So this means I'll have to, uh, if I play bishop e7, take back with a queen to protect c5. But that is not very sexy, so I think I'm just going to play queen b6 and uh, keep an eye on uh, d4. Plus, uh, idea to hit the bishop, and then maybe just go bishop e7, offer the trade, and I can take with the knight, get castle, and easily finishing the development. Still, I'm not uh, super sure what's like best here, but this just feels very natural uh, to play. We're still like in the opening phase, so uh, yeah, quite a lot of events already happening uh, <laughs> as early as move 7. Uh, I guess this is why uh, we love the game of chess so much. It never really becomes boring. I mean, and as long as you don't play the Petrov. So, uh, let's see queen b6. And yeah, expecting a move like bishop to d3 here. That would be my main candidate. Probably bishop e2 as well. Uh, some odds for knight bd2 to happen, but I don't think that's like such a good move. Knight BD2 will actually show a very kind of beautiful win for black. Uh, hope he actually plays it so I can show it, but mostly it's going to be bishop D3. Uh, I expect... Uh, oh, knight H4. I actually had a bit of like a feeling that he might try knight H4 as well, but that is like clearly not a good move. And uh, I think the simplest way to deal with this is, okay, he wants to take, give me the double pawns, and uh, we say, uh, nope. We don't want the double pawns, and we're going to be taking the knight. And I know this move looks like super weird at first, yeah? But it actually is combined with a bit of a tactical justification. So whenever you are thinking of playing a weird move, don't play it just because it's weird. If you have like a kind of a, a concrete justification, weird moves can work. But you've got to be very careful, because if you don't win any material after the weird move, then just end up looking like a freak, so you don't want to do that. I mean, why would you? Just go CD4. And we're just kind of exploiting the fact that uh, White has played this uh, knight h4 move, putting the knight on the edge, and now no longer defending the d4 pawn. When I go c4, like acting like, you know, opponent like trying to keep it cool, like, all right, I've got this. This was all uh, planned, so I like his attitude, but uh, yeah, I think we can just like uh, keep developing. When you can like gain a tempo, it's even better. So that's why we start with a check here. Not because whenever check is uh, legal, you should play it. That's usually uh, low IQ mentality. So I'm just going to go like uh, 97. Bishop takes uh, before I'm planning to like take with a queen. Give a check again. Um, and if he does not do that, I'm going to castle. Also, 97 is nice because after CD5, we can take with a knight and avoid the isolated pawn. So, um, yeah. Let's see what um, he's got uh, in mind now. Either taking or simply castling, then play like rook ad8. Uh, also, by the way, the e5 pawn is kind of hanging, but since we're already up a pawn... I'm definitely not uh, rushing of uh, grabbing even more material. Our priority is to uh, finish development and get castle, which just happened. Now, I'm actually wondering, uh, even though it's hard to believe, maybe he has ideas to go for like a Greek if with bishop takes on h7. So, uh, yeah, just to like, uh, for safety measures, it could be clever to just play h6 and be like, no Greek if for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, it probably castles now. I can definitely exchange, but that would kind of uh, develop his queen. So I'd prefer just to let him trade if he wants. And I'm just going to go rook f8. Notice, guys, that I can trade many pieces, but I'm not making any trades. Because usually the weaker side is the one that's releasing the tension. So I'm thinking to just place the rooks like this. This is in the open file, and this is on the potentially semi-open file as well. So... I think to start with this, uh, just because this may uh, happen at some point, and this rook uh, comes to c8, if he takes, I'm planning to take with the queen. So he goes bishop to c2. Now, it's still kind of risky to take, because that will uh, actually pin my queen, which is probably not great. I could maybe take there and then uh, do that. But then, once again, his rook opens up. 
So uh, yeah, I'll just make, um, I could be making another improving move. And after takes, takes, put him probably once queen d3, trying to go for some kind of uh, attacking idea. Hmm. Why is opponent tricky? Oh, I've got no time. So I should probably make a move. Yeah, I think that's kind of the time where we start making moves. I think I'm just gonna go rook c8 and uh, the plan is pretty simple. On bishop b4, I'm gonna be taking with the knight so we are, that we're trying to eliminate uh, potentially the only attacking piece that uh, my opponent has. So, um, okay, let's see what he wants to do. Oh, bishop f4, just uh, kind of chilling. I could do d3. I could do like knight g6. It's not a bad move either. I think I'm just going to play this, so make sure this guy is like safe, safely uh, protected and uh, potentially going knight b4. Okay, just need to protect against that. So I think knight g6 should be reasonable. Uh, now this becomes a threat among uh, knight takes on f4. It's a positional idea to go knight b4 and eliminate his important bishop. Just got to make like a couple of quick moves so we catch up uh, on time, getting the five seconds increment each move. That's uh, quite nice. So this is the time that I usually recommend for you guys if you are trying to get a nice volume of gains while also uh, having decent time to think uh, when trying to improve a chess. Five and uh, five is one of my favorites. Five minutes and three seconds only chess is also fine. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to be taking... Yes, I am opening up his rook, but I'm doing that because I'm creating a pretty obvious target on c4. So now that we finished development, centralized all of our pieces, uh, it's actually time to go after more material. But it's really important that you do it in uh, this fashion, so uh, you don't like go super greedy while you haven't even castled. So, uh, yeah. Could play b6 before taking on c4, making sure that my pawn is not going to be vulnerable to any ideas like that. Um, yeah, just super secure game. Whenever he plays knight 2 we can like get rid of it and then like pick up c4. The bishop is like not really having any prospects. It's quite nicely dominated by our g6 knight. Uh, yes, it's not very often that a knight dominates a bishop, but I guess this is one of the cases. Because uh, it's controlling the only bishop squares available. So, um... Uh, yeah, opponent definitely uh, taking uh, some time here. Not an easy position to uh, have by any means. He just plays rook b3. Just gonna do this b6 idea as I promised. Just uh, looking forward to pick up c4 without hanging b7. He is, uh, yeah, probably just gonna double up. That ends up happening. Just gonna take. And uh, next, uh, we could potentially just uh, push the pawn all the way to d2, and that is going to be like uh, sort of uh, keeping uh, all of uh, white's pieces uh, like really busy with uh, with defending that. So if you think about it, I mean, this guy is like worth uh, one point if you're like thinking about like uh, material balance. I mean, maybe the pawn is actually like uh, one and a half nowadays due to the crazy inflation, but... Say it gets to d2, one point will keep like, I don't know, a queen and a rook. So that is usually like 14 points of material busy. I think that's like a pretty good deal for us. Uh, even though I'm not like a great math guy, I think one compared to like 14 is pretty good odds that we have. So um, he takes that. I mean, see, see guys, I mean, the, the house is burning and... Getting my Josephine here is worrying about makeup. Yeah, that's how it happens. Like, look at this pawn. Now, okay. Let me just grab a7. Sure. That will, of course, matter, no? <laughs> uh, I'm just going to move uh, the bishop, clearing uh, the path for the queen. And uh, the way to actually finish this quickly is just go uh, queen to c1. Actually, queen c2 is quite an instructive uh, idea as well, which, uh, yeah, I mean, just to... Exchange queens, but queen c1 is even nicer because whenever he takes, we do get to promote and uh, we win a rook in the process. So, c rook to b3. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna go uh, queen c1. Just uh, I could have like sacked the queen even, but I just want to keep it simple. Hoping he plays rook b1 and then we show a nice uh, little cute idea because it looks like uh, opponent is uh, able to kind of keep his 
things together, but Black has a very nice uh, little idea at the little breakthrough. Uh, White's uh, fortress. So, um, hoping opponent plays that, yeah, and it does. And still, you can win slow with takes and rook c1, but even nicer is just taking the rook. So, uh, we're making sure the queen goes uh, away and then we get to promote the pawn. Um, and Okay, that's also kind of luckily gonna give us a back rank checkmate and uh, allow us to get a pretty nice uh, finish. So, um, yeah, I mean, not sure what uh, really happened in uh, in this game. I was like kind of <laughs> on my own since like B3 happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, like CD is like very logical move i should have probably gone for it but i was just like okay let me like keep the tension for a bit and then we just like won this central pawn and uh yeah just kept developing kind of instructive i think or at least i hope it was that uh we avoided the great gift say i play something ignorant bishop h7 could sometimes get you in trouble okay i mean here i, I mean i knew it was not working but just think of it you have to play king g6 to get a winning position if you play king g8, I mean, white has at least a perpetual according to the computer, and it's usually becoming very dangerous. So you really want to pay attention to this kind of great gift ideas when uh, white has like a bishop, knight, queen, and the pawn on e5, so you don't have the knight on f6. Great gift ideas are always dangerous. So just played h6, making sure there is none of that, and uh, then just brought my rooks to the central files. Had to defend against like checkmate threat and uh, yeah, the rest was pretty simple once we uh, completed development and uh, started focusing on uh, the remaining uh, weaknesses that um, uh, White had, which ultimately uh, concurred in pushing the spawn while Grandma Josephine was worrying about makeup. Always happens like that, so... <laughs> um, just clear out the path for the opponent. Uh, you get a pretty easy win. So with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody, looks like we're getting a game with the black pieces. And uh, I'm just going to be sticking uh, with our beloved uh, Karo Khan defense. And let's see what my opponent has in mind to do. Definitely three big main alternatives. E5, Knight, C3, or taking... Sometimes they do play uh, the fantasy, but quite rare. I have a video on how to beat that in literally seven moves. But uh, for now, we do get the exchange. So already by this point, uh, if you want to like properly learn your openings, you've got to have an idea planned in mind on how you're about to like develop your pieces. So I'm going to be taking, and unless they play some kind of uh, super aggressive line like the panel with C4, most people do something uh, like knight f3 or just something a bit like slower. Maybe they give a check on b5. That's also a thing. Maybe they develop this knight. Those moves uh, I would be expecting. So now, how you want to think of like openings uh, in general, you just want to have them, you know, like think of it as you're traveling and you have like a map. Yeah, you have like the road. Uh, you know, it's like telling you the map, what to do and where you should be getting. But in the meantime, as you are, you know, traveling and uh, utilizing the map, you need to like look around to like not die and stuff like that. So that's exactly what we do here. So our map is saying our knights are going onto the natural squares. The bishop ideally goes to g4. I mean, if they play some kind of early h3 stopping that, we're going to be playing bishop to f5 instead. We just like prefer to have the open uh, bishop. And then uh, we go e6. and I think uh, below uh, 1500, the easiest is just to go bishop e7 and castle short against uh, more or less anything that white does. So knowing this, that's kind of what you want to keep in the back of your mind. And then the only thing that we need to do is just adapt in case opponent does like anything crazy. So uh, with that in mind, I mean, uh, yeah, let's just see if uh, <laughs> it is as simple as uh, we want it to be. Obviously, knight c3 already is a bit of a positional mistake, uh, as you guys already know, since you are a man of culture, that's like, a, you know, regular uh, Alex Banza viewer. Uh, I play the London system a lot, and you know that in this structure, the pawn belongs to c3, and uh, bishop goes to f4, knight to d2, and white's fighting for like e5 square. Knight on c3 already quite... Uh, 
quite a big uh, inaccuracy, but um, definitely a very common move below 1500, which is making it very easy for us. We're going to continue our plan with bishop to g4. And on h3, this is actually a very interesting moment because we have a choice between two interesting moves. So in this particular case, there is absolutely nothing wrong with uh, stepping back. But the little rule that I like to use, and uh, I think this is also how I'm going to like uh, uh, structure the material in my upcoming chessable course on the Karo, whenever white has the knight on c3, uh, it's always okay to take on f3. So I like to stick with that. So we just take. Now, they would normally take with a queen. And I think uh, knight takes on d4 is a bit of an inaccuracy because of queen d3. If my memory serves me well. So I'm not going to do that. Of course, he may get uh, scared of that and just go gf. Anyway, which is like amazing for us positionally. Um, but I mean, I guess we'll have to wait and see what he does. So um, I guess against both moves, I'm going to be going e6, trying knight f6, bishop e7, castling. And then we try to go for the queen side play. So sure, you can be prepared for how we are going to develop the queen side play in advance. But I mean, uh, I really recommend uh, what you like really want to remember is how you get castled. Once you make sure you get castled uh, with a reasonable position in every single game, then I think uh, it makes more sense that uh, you worry about how to play the middle games and like this kind of stuff. So ooh, we see G takes on F3, which is giving my opponents like a very... <clears throat> sort of uh, vulnerable structure. I mean, th these pawns are like really, really ugly together. They cannot really defend each other. And I mean, that's like a really uh, big long-term weakness. So uh, I'm just going to pursue with uh, normal development. I'm just going to go like uh, e6, bishop, e7. I mean, if you think about these pawns, uh, they are basically like... Uh, uh, Let's say some brothers that uh, uh, never talk again. So <laughs> it's like looks like they're next to each other, but they never really get in touch. So definitely not uh, a good pair of pawns. So just going to go e6. And once again, maybe it makes more sense to play bishop e6. But it's not going to be like game changing. So I'd much rather recommend you keep it simple. Go bishop e7, get castled. Uh, yes, this is a little bit of a weird structure now that uh, we got this thingy going over there, but I would say still castling in general, you shouldn't be afraid of the rook that's coming to like the open file. Because uh, most of the times you can just play g6 and annihilate that uh, pressure that white gets. So that's like completely fine. Opponent takes on f6, which is actually quite a common mistake that I see even some of my students uh, make. I mean, majority of my students are like 1,000, but they do play perfect. Uh, but okay, sometimes uh, you may see such things. Now, the issue with bishop takes on f6 in general uh, is that normally you want to be making this move only when your opponent is uh, wasting a tempo on attacking the bishop. Then taking makes more sense. But taking right away is usually just a typical... Uh, Mistake for the low-rated players. Going to be taking back uh, with a bishop, hitting d4. Expecting 92, and there we go. Opponent finds actually a good move. And now, if I'm like really trying to uh, play the very best move, I think queen b6 looks quite interesting. Threatening 94, probably forcing c3. Then we could try to grab that pawn on b2. Opponent has rook b1. We can take on a2. He's going to collect the b7 pawn. Uh, we can get castled and we're still having an extra pawn. However, I think this uh, embarking on these kind of adventures is sometimes risky. And if you're not sure, especially for the lower rated players, I would encourage you to get castled. Keep it simple. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, we already have kind of like a long term advantage. Okay, guys, this is like basically we've got a big lead in a marathon here with this. Uh, ruined pawn structure so uh, it's gonna like really take a while for our opponent to uh, catch up so it's basically like we're running with uh, just some like fresh uh, Nike sneakers and he has to complete the marathon while being behind with like his bare foot so that is that is not a pleasant thing especially on a rainy day so he goes queen d2 now what do we do 
get the rook the open files uh, always. So uh, you really want to make sure you bring uh, your pieces and uh, get the most value out of them. The rooks are the most uh, effective pieces to uh, put on the open files. Usually it's heavy pieces, so queens as well, but uh, putting your queen there when your opponent has rooks, it's usually uh, a little bit uh, scary, you know, because it uh, can attack your queen, so you'll have to move away. Now, opponent is castling. The king is, is, is like a little bit vulnerable. But uh, yeah, we could definitely think of uh, maneuvering this knight. Maybe play b5, try to go for like the minority attack. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just start with the thematic minority attack. I'll have to speed up just a bit because uh, I spend a lot of time talking nonsense like I usually do and we only have 30 seconds, but this is an increment game. So uh, yeah, we do get five seconds for the each move. And now his last move is actually quite a big positional mistake because it's... Uh, creating a backward pawn, because the pawn is fixed, it cannot be advanced, and it cannot be protected by any other pawns. And uh, this pawn is really weak, I mean, you can think of it as, let's say, like a turtle that's fallen on its back, and it's just fucked, it cannot move, it's just there for, like, the rest of the game. It's gonna be really vulnerable. So, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna defend uh, this pawn, he's attacking my queen. We'll better not uh, hang it here. That would be quite an embarrassing moment, especially for you guys that are watching. So, uh, maybe a bit relatable, but I wouldn't do it. So, when here and what I'm planning to do next, I just want to improve the position of this knight. I was about to say knight f5, but now, since this is able to capture it, I'm no longer such a huge fan of it. And this may not be, like, the greatest move ever, but I want to maneuver the knight. Oh actually uh, completely forgot about the fact that he can do that. Oh, almost got flagged. I'm not like really worried about him doubling up the pawns. That's fine. I just like move the rook so we could get this thing uh, going. Okay, he's attacking f6. I mean, this guy, I'm aggressive chess right here. Oh my God, that's maybe like one of the toughest 1000 rated players that I've ever uh, faced, but we're gonna... Take him into the end game, as we usually like to do with this uh, unmannered, uh, low-rated players. But I'm still gonna have aggressive ideas, uh, trying to use this rook, uh, keeping uh, both options uh, open. And he has to now sidestep play King H1. Other than that, uh, he's just gonna lose because of the pin, because like Knight is coming over to F4 or H4 even. Uh, so he does that, but yeah, I think it's still lost because after he takes, I have only one move to block the chick, but that is like good enough. And I don't see how he's willing to defend the bishop, so that was kind of uh, risky by him. But uh, yeah, now he's offering a queen trade like everybody should when you are down a piece. I mean, I'm just kidding, guys. Obviously, that's... Uh, it's not a thing. Uh, when you're down material, you should try to keep as many pieces as you can, trying to go for like the swindle. Uh, no, I mean, he's just making it so easy. We're just like happy to trade all the pieces, guys. I mean, when you're winning, just exchange everything. It's just like you're up 3 0 in like a football game, let's say. Yeah, and I mean, you're not gonna risk like your best players to injure them. Yeah, when, when the game is like already won. So you gotta get in these like substitutes and. The knight was ready to <laughs> get the job done by uh, going knight e2, picking up the c3 pawn, and then just winning. So, I hope this game was somewhat instructive. I mean, I did uh, get a crushing position out of the opening, uh, and uh, it was supposed to remain crushing for the rest of the game until I forgot that there is a hanging pawn on c3. Oh my gosh, guys, how can I miss that? I mean, uh, I do have to say I was just kind of like not really paying attention and I just wanted to show you this gorgeous maneuver of uh, getting the knight all the way to c4. I mean, probably I would have had to move it again since that would have blocked my queens and that would have made any sense and probably uh, caused you unsubscribe to the channel. But anyways, that didn't happen. So um, he just went knight h5 and now I was just like kind of uh, panicking with uh, 10 seconds on my clock. Still, our position is like kind of completely winning the whole time according to the computer. Uh, not that it's really something that should matter, but um, yeah, I could have gone for like uh, the easier queen f4. By the way, that would have been way stronger because it's actually just 
forcing the queen trade. Kind of his only move is to take, and then we would have won the bishop. Similar idea, knight f4, of course, just still completely winning. And uh, yeah, I mean, as I was saying, the only kind of critical idea for him was king h1, but would have probably just lost after knight f4. And then something, I mean, I still don't see like this very straightforward path to the win, but computer says it's like minus five, so probably there is something. It's just the move f5, but I don't quite get the threat. I mean, it's actually just like a zugzwang if you think about it, which is weird. Why is it like such a big zugzwang? Oh, you just like double up, and um, yeah, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty unlucky for white. Uh, very tough to to deal with that. So, yeah, if there is uh, anything you wanna take away from uh, this game, these pawns are pretty bad, uh, and yeah, just keep it simple, play normal, and. In the long run, uh, you will have a much better position as long as you don't hang any significant uh, amount of material. So uh, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Right, everybody, boys and girls, looks like we're about to get another Karo Khan for the series. So let's see what this opponent has in mind. Uh, he's already kind of uh, thinking for, for a bit. Just gonna play d5 and uh, now white has a big crossroad. So it's either exchange knight c3 or e5. So against knight c3 we like to take. Important, super, super important actually if we've got like any new players to the game that just want to pick up the Karo Khan. Very common mistake that I see in this position made uh, pretty often by low rated players. They go for knight f6 because they forget to take on e4. And it's important to take on e4 because knight f6 e5 and the knight doesn't really have a good square to retreat. So do not forget to take. The opponent also had it pre-moved and just play knight f6. Inviting him to take and then go for the tar attack over now. Uh, that's the most common move. If bishop d3, that's like a typical kind of uh, inaccuracy allowing queen takes on d4. And I think black has a very easy game there. <clears throat> Besides that, Knight g3, I like g6, and we ha also had the game uh, that went knight c5, and then e5 is a pretty good move for black. So that should kind of get you started with the sidelines. I believe we also had a game with knight c3 in the video that's uh, called uh, mm, How to Win If You Suck a Chess, or something like that. I come up with a lot of dumb titles, I know. So knight takes on f6, I'm gonna be taking back with a pawn, of course, just making sure we get a pretty healthy one structure on the king side and now you really want to start with bishop d6 and uh, no need to rush with bishop g4 it could get pretty awkward if you start with that like at some point i can trick you on the e-file and it's simply like not the most efficient way to play bishop g4 which is a very common uh, slight inaccuracy that i see among my students games so get castle first then play bishop to g4 so uh Let's see what our uh, opponent has in mind to do. Normally they castle short in this structure from my experience. However, if they castle long, normally it gets pretty risky for them, I would say. So I could start with a check, try to be annoying. We'll do that. Provoke bishop e3. And then I'm not even gonna like bother with this kind of stuff. I'm just gonna go for the typical pin. If h3, we always keep the tension in the Tartagor by sliding back. The only positions where where we take are those where he's forced to take back with a pawn and we ruin the structure. Other than that, uh, we mainly just uh, go for this. So, um, yeah, he castles. Just gonna bring the knight towards f8, which is kind of the most confusing part of the variation. Literally everybody is wondering, dude, why are you getting that knight onto f8? I don't get it, I'm not gonna play it. I mean, I just have a question for you guys that are watching. You see, like, a stronger player, okay? It doesn't have to be me, yeah? I mean, I totally understand if you feel like you're smarter than me. I mean, who wouldn't? But let's say you see a stronger player making a move. Why don't you play it yourself? I mean, why do you need to understand everything? Just just play it and see if it works, okay? Try that. What an interesting concept, I know. Now, besides that, let me actually explain you why. I think it is actually a pretty interesting idea in this structure. So, besides making sure that you're never going to get mated, uh, it can also maneuver to e6 and then to f4. And it's just a very nice knight that's not standing in the way of your pieces. A lot of people just rush with like knight b6, d5, but if let's say there's no bishop to take on e3, they get hit by c4 and they don't know what to do with a knight. So 
That's quite a common theme that uh, I see among the black players uh, while trying to go for the Tarta cover. Now, a few words about the structure in general. You already obviously noticed we've got the double pawns and uh, white has a bit of an edge on this side with four against three. So this means uh, we have to avoid the end games. We don't want to like trade pieces or especially like queens if you trade queens. It's going to be hard for us to like, get any dynamics. Uh, okay, opponent just plays g4, so he's kind of losing his mind already with the spin. Of course, very nice for us because he's overextending on the king side. So I was about to say, white is the one that's trying to get into the end games, while as black, because we have our spawn structure, we try to come up with dynamics. So such a dynamic would have been after like knight f8, bishop c7, queen d6, ideas to go for checkmate. That was That is like one of the main plans that we have. <clears throat> against g4 just slide back with a bishop and if he takes you guys already know that the pawn cube is a win by four so not even gonna bother explaining that and uh, i've got a pretty fun idea that the computer likes in these positions because believe it or not we actually have a previous rating climb with the karo khan and these positions are super common they play like this all the time and if he does like nothing say he plays rookie one uh, okay that's just like similar to resigning for him because we get the pawn cube the most OP pawn structure that exists in chess. Uh, no clickbait. So, if you would have played, uh, say something like, uh, oh, even here it's nice. I'm gonna be like, oh no, my knight. Just can't take my knight. Oh no. That is just a free knight. Look at this. Wow, such a long day, guys. Wow. He didn't think, ah, oh, this doesn't work. <laughs> I'm so mad. Okay, now, for those of you that are wondering, this is actually the trick that I wanted to show previously. So, the computer really fell in love with this move when I, like, analyzed this position. Because I'm telling you, everybody overextends like this. It's so common. It's crazy. So, if they take, you want to go for bishop h2. He takes the bishop, say, whatever. We pick up the queen black wins. That's pretty easy. Now we just, uh, you know, the other thing of it is if they don't fall for the trap, we just get a very active knight. And I think I'm just going to follow up with the battery. Just bishop c7, queen d6, rook a d8. And I think that's a pretty tricky position for my opponent to play. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but um, I feel pretty comfortable. Not sure if it's the position of the, of, or the new chair, but um, I like the fact that we're going to go queen d6. I'm simply in love with this idea if it's legal in the tartak war you should be doing it but remember in the tartak war because i actually noticed some people see this idea in the tartak war and they are like whenever they get the bishop to d6 they play bishop c7 queen d6 even if white has like a knight and two pawns here they still go for that i mean you have to keep sort of realistic expectations um about that so uh, in the tartak war it's really the best uh of the cases when it comes to this type of maneuver. So I would really uh, advise you guys, whenever you're like trying to remember anything and you're trying to like learn the Karo Khan, you really want to think of it in terms of uh, variations. So I've had Karo Khan, this variation, that variation. So we apply these and that rules. And to be a little bit more specific, as probably I already confused the heck out of you. Let's say here we've got uh, the uh let's say battery thing you really want to think of it not as oh we played the Karo Khan, we do the battery that would be the wrong way to think about it and that's how you get it uh, messed up you want to think about it oh we have tartak verse structure after let's say we get double pawns then the battery is very interesting and it's always going to be kind of nice so uh knight there i think that doesn't stop our main idea he plays f4 but then now i see a pretty loose bishop I see a pretty loose bishop. What are we thinking of? Tactics, of course. Tactics is the answer to everything. Now, uh, knight takes on c3 doesn't quite work because of queen takes protecting the bishop. Knight to g3, he's gonna most likely go rook e1. Now, question is, can we actually sack on e3? Kind of doubt, and then go queen f4. Uh, that's definitely way too complicated for me to calculate. G5 comes to mind, just putting pressure on this. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to keep it simple. No need to 
yeah, I try to seek for like the perfect solution, just something that's kind of improving our position and um, it's making a threat is good. Also, if you want rookie seven and double up, probably was good enough as well, maybe even better. But it just felt like uh, applying pressure to this diagonal should be kind of relevant. So yeah, I mean, before my uh, opponent uh, interrupted me, I, I wanted to say, you think of this type of rules in the Tartakovar, this kind of rules in the advance and other rules in the exchange variation. That's how you can easily recreate all these things. So now after queen g2, the problem for my opponent is that I can do this move without him being able to take anymore with the queen saving the bishop. So that looks like a pretty winning tactic to me. I mean, winning a pawn, he already know the drill. Win a pawn, exchange all the pieces. Uh, yeah, what else could you wish uh, more in life? So let's see what he wants to do against this little idea. He literally has no counterplay while the king is going to be incredibly exposed. So this is looking better and better. Just uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> Threatening to take on uh, on e3. Come on, opponent, make a move. He's running out of time. Please don't flag. Okay, rook there. Really want to sack. Shall we? I mean, I'm just going to keep it simple. No need to sack when there's like such an easily winning move. Uh, knight f4, so we hit d4 or just gf. Probably gf is like easiest. Rook a, rook a, I don't mind. And yeah, there's like g5 defending, but simply maybe knight e3. Bishop takes, pawn takes, opening up this monster battery. Uh, the queen and bishop will be awakening. So let's see what opponent has in mind. Okay, bishop takes. He's not listening, man. He's just gonna forget about the meat. What's this? Come on, opponent. He, he's not paying attention, guys. I'm telling you. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Prove me wrong the very next second. All right. Uh, let's pick up this phone. Just got the. Uh, so many extra pieces. Now just need to bring uh, literally everything into the game. Uh, rookie 3 is always losing the bishop to b6, applying even more pressure onto that uh, deadly pin. So, gonna do this. And that should give us a pretty promising position, I uh, I must say. There is rook e3 as a big idea. Can he play like knight f1? Yes, but I could maybe just do queen e3. It's kind of a nice little looking move. Wait, there is one game I have more time on the clock than my opponent. Guys, you should clip this. This is perhaps the only case uh, this ever happened in the history of rating climbs. So, definitely a milestone. Now give a check and then picking this up. Just like... Uh, Stealing the candy from a baby. It's that simple, guys. In case you are wondering how to win with a Tartakover, Villa 1000, it is that simple. I gotta tell you. I gotta be honest. I gotta be honest. Nothing fancy. Okay, just uh, trade everything. Bishop f4. Hitting this and uh, threatening to exchange the knight. Uh, yeah, just trade rooks now. Okay, opponent just resigned. I was about to play king g2, check him and uh, take on h2, so uh, then start collecting the pawns. So, okay, I mean, this, this game is like nothing more but uh, just a confirmation that the pawn cube is uh, winning by force. So, queen d3. I think I've literally had the same position many times before, so I, I, I told you like knight c5 is the best move. And um, yeah, the point was this. And discovery. Pick up the queen. And then, of course, even f5 was better, apparently. I played g5, second uh, slash third line, and knight c3, final little trick, and 
everything was falling apart afterwards. So, okay, that was just um, can't really comment much on this game, guys. Just like play the Tartak over, you get uh, your knight to f8 like a good boy. Oh, never mind, actually, ended up landing on c5. You get the point, okay? You get where I'm going with this. So, uh, with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. Oh my god, if you really made it this far into the video, you're a true legend. And in case you perhaps want to learn more about the Karo Khan defense, please feel free to click the video that will uh, appear on the screen. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. And I'll see you around on the channel. Take care.